is really exciting. This is not only my first time speaking, it's my first conference ever. So I don't think I've been in front of a larger... <laughs> the largest group I've been in front of is like stand-up for the last 10 years, so... Anyway, uh, my name's Peter Pekarczyk. I'm a uh, UI engineer at Trunk Club. And if I could go to the next slide, I would. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm a UI engineer at Trunk Club. Uh, and if you haven't heard of us, we connect you with stylists. They'll talk to you about what you're looking for and what your kind of look is. And then we'll send you a whole trunk full of clothing. You keep what you like, and you return what you don't like. No subscription fees, easy as that. Uh, the cool part is we build all our internal tools from the ground up. Everything from our catalog to the warehouse to all of our internal tools. It's great. And it's cool working with physical products, too. Uh, so we're located in Chicago, and if you're ever around, feel free to stop by. We're very nice people. All right, getting started. So how many people here use or have used Backbone in production? Oh, great, nice. Now, how many of you have wanted to use React for one reason or another, but haven't had the time or resources to get started? There's always a PM or someone, family member, that, like, no, you can't work after work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go home, right? There's always something that comes up that stops us from doing that. And we can't just like flip things over one day, right? Those things just don't happen. A lot of what you see here will be coffee script or sort of pseudo coffee script because that's what we've been using. But otherwise, I'd recommend Babel, which comes with ES6 and JSX right out of the box. It's freaking fantastic. So let's start with Trunk Club Past and Present. We have the stack called Brunch with Panache, a modular approach to building web apps with Brunch. This was created by someone at Trunk Club named Josh, named Josh Habdis, and it's been fantastic. Uh, more or less, it's Backbone, Chaplin, jQuery, Brunch, and CoffeeScript. For those of you that haven't heard of Chaplin or Brunch, uh, it's very similar to Marionette. It offers controllers, uh, automatic memory management, Rails-like routes and custom routers, Common JS and AMD support all those cool things that we've always wanted as front-end developers. It was like the dream framework for the longest time. Uh, Brunch is more or less similar to Gulp and, Rea or Gulp and Grunt. It's a build tool. It takes care of all the minification and the stuff that we don't really worry about anymore. That used to be a big deal, right? Uh, Chaplin also comes with a mediator, which is our pub-sub communication between apps. Uh, so it's great for like moving member data around, for example. We like to automate all of our process redundancies. The philosophy is onion apps. Peel back the layers as you need to. Let's avoid complexity. Let's, fatter, let's follow patterns and scale. And it's what let us build great apps really, really quickly. So here we go. Humble SOA trunk club beginnings. We had a service-oriented architecture and two of these BWP apps. Simple API calls. Only a few services, not much to go wrong. It was fun. Those were great days. But as you can imagine, things change very, very quickly. The company starts growing, so do the business requirements, and we kept building and building and building. We had more single page apps, we had more APIs, and we had more dependencies. We were making API, <laughs> excuse me, we were making API calls to numerous services, and stuff started getting hectic. We want to improve that member experience. We built wardrobes, recommendations, a whole freaking warehouse that all work together in one way, shape, or form. The technology behind it is great. And it worked great for a long time until it stopped working that great. And that's when, <laughs> that's when we had some issues we needed to take care of. We have a fantastic group of engineers, but as a UI team, we wanted to try to solve those issues on our own. So what was happening? We were making numerous API calls and doing a lot of hydration client side. And it worked. Uh, but the thing is, we were doing a lot of useless re-rendering, which increased load times. And we had like the craziest flame chart spikes. Like we needed to fix that. As engineers, we didn't like that stuff. Uh, and then from the business side too, our users were complaining, our stylists, same with our leadership. And we were dedicating a lot of time for render order debugging, and optimizations, and it was great, it was fun, but we wanted to spend less time debugging and more time building cool software, like we all do. Uh, patches weren't really doing the trick anymore. So what could we do? 
React to the rescue. Replacing backbone views with React. Instant gratification. I'm sure most of you know what React is uh, by now, but just as a quick recap, reusable encapsulated components. It's got a fantastic diffing algorithm that re-renders only what it needs to re-render, which, which is what makes it so fast. We love the declarative style that makes it easy to focus on the app itself rather than coming up with like nitty gritty solutions to making things work. We just say, hey, React, we're going to give you some data, render it. You know, we're not going to tell it how to do it. And there was less mental overhead with bringing in templates and views together. I know, I know, it's hard thinking about putting those two things together, but trust me, the world is great after a couple of components. You guys will never go back. And most importantly, for the first time ever, our backends were much more comfortable with working with our code. BDLBUP was fantastic from a UI perspective. It did everything we wanted it to do. But our backends didn't want to work with this or that. And it's not because they didn't want to. It's because it did get confusing. You had to invest a lot of time up front to understand how the framework works for it to be effective, right? With React, we were able to move a lot of that stuff over to the backends and let them work on their apps as well without really interfering with the UI, with the UI team. So we're like more of the experts they would come to if they need help. Otherwise, they're building great stuff on their own too. We started with a simple drop down. And now we're up to about 80 components in each of our apps, and everything keeps growing. Our components aren't necessarily huge, but for the ones that are and have a ton of internal state, React makes it much easier to manage. And that's just like less headaches. So here we are. I don't know how well you can see that, but this is everything. This is the view and the template combined. It might look a little crazy, but you have to remember, it's not HTML. It's JSX, which is JavaScript. And everything just made sense. So in this case, uh, I might be getting ahead of myself here with props, but you've got a header, and then you've got a logo, and then things just trickle down accordingly. Our code became much more manageable. That's a lot easier to understand than, oh, open up this view that corresponds to this template, but then there's this, like, oh, you know, now we use this like, external method that you need to download too. No more mind-boggling things. Everything's right here in front of you in simple, easy-to-use files. Our backends, our designers, everyone was a huge fan. So speaking of design, it helped with CSS too. It made much more sense. So what we started doing is we started modeling our CSS classes after our React components. It's much easier to traverse CSS and make changes. And designers are more comfortable making those changes too. There was a time where you'd have you know, thousands of lines for a couple of simple things. But did it really make sense? Was it effective? Was it maintainable? Those were questions that we asked ourselves and knew, uh, <laughs> we knew the answers to. We needed to make a change. So now we have a one-to-one -one relationship between our React component and CSS. And it's helped all of our apps grow. It just makes sense. It's as easy as going into Sublime, searching for a class, letting that designer change that information, and then if they need to find it in the React component, they can easily open up that file and make the change themselves without relying on another UI resource to make it happen. Our design and code became much more manageable. The best part about all of this is there's no magic involved. It's just good JavaScript, right? I'm guilty of saying this, but I had to look up call, bind, and apply because when's the last time you had to use that in like a framework like Backbone? I haven't had to use it for a while. Uh, all those frameworks abstracted all those awesome layers of JavaScript, let you build cool things, but then you forget about the most important stuff, right? So React kind of reintroduces you to those concepts and lets you build cool stuff. And sort of foreshadowing here, handle click dot bind. If you haven't used React yet, <laughs> you're going to like this. This will help you a lot. Remember this slide, because I did run into a couple issues with this in the past, but now it's awesome. Anyway, we came up with the whole migration process. Because like I said, we can't just flip the switch, turn stuff on, and let our users see all this broken code, right? So we started with small components, things that don't really have a lot of data, things that we just wanted to try out and see how they worked, random pages. We used the Mixin. Uh, if you haven't used React, a Mixin is sort of like a plugin. It's React's answer to sharing code between multiple components. I know 
components are reusable, but there are times where you don't really need a component to make stuff happen. Uh, form validation, for example, you could have a simple mix-in with the regex involved and apply classes accordingly, or apply state accordingly. Uh, we use something called the Rea Backbone React component, which I'll talk to, talk to you about more in a second, and that glues Backbone models and collections into React components. Once, it mount, once it's mounted, a wrapper will listen to those changes and automatically set your component state for you. Frickin' awesome. Lastly, we wanted to get familiar with the API. There are things like initialize and remove in Backbone that we wanted to see if we can match to in React just to kind of get a feeling for it and really understand. If we had component did mount, component will unmount, unmount component at node, those are all great things that'll help you kind of transition over. But most importantly, convert your parent view to use react.create element instead. So you're rendering all these views out in Backbone and you need some sort of a tie, some sort of adapter to make those changes happen for you in React. And that's when we came up with the React Backbone adapter. This was actually made by Jason Block, who's actually in the crowd. Hey, Jason. Uh, it's, a very simple, it's a very simple set of uh, utilities that helps us attach that component to the Backbone view. So we pass in an element, we pass in a container, and then finally an optional callback. You don't necessarily need the callback, but it's there just in case. Um, so here we are. We create, identify, attach, render, and then finally dispose. So we cr create whatever element you'd like. We add a React tree class to identify within the DOM. It's more of a sanity check for us. Uh, we apply classes to all of our backbone views. It was sort of a good habit to bring that over. When we're debugging, we know right away, oh, that must be coming from React. Let's check the React folder ahead of time and so we don't run into any weird issues. We then append that element to the backbone view and then let React go from there. Just render everything, call the callback if you pass one. Otherwise, React, do your thing. You're great at it. Uh, and finally, dispose. So not only do we unmount the React component and remove it from the DOM, uh, you can't forget about the container, the one with React tree. Let's remove that as well. It just makes it easier. You don't want that stuff lingering around. So like I said, we use Chaplin, um, and it delivers, and it gives us controllers. So here we are. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with member conversion and onboarding. It's a huge part of my team. I'm on the member-facing team, and we, we want to convert as many users as possible, right? Um, in this case, here we are. We've got a sign-up header. Just a simple logo that stretches across the top of your screen. How can we get that into the browser in a nice way without freaking out too much? So here we go. We use CommonJS, so we require that uh, module, and then we create an element with it, sign up header, as you can see here. Uh, there's one thing here that may look a little weird, and that's the reuse. It's, it's a Chaplin composition function. What that lets us do is it grants us the ability to reuse data and views beyond one controller action. It's a nice performance perk that we get right out of the box. So then, like I said, element, container, and callback. We've got a sign up header. We've got a simple uh, utility function to get whatever that header function, or whatever that, wherever that header lies, we kind of query it. It's, it's basically query selector behind the scenes. And then the callback if you need it. React gives you component did mount if you need some sort of uh, utility method and you want to talk to something. But if you're looking for more control via backbone, that's what the callback is there for. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but as engineers, we always want to move forward. And so we started coming up with the React Backbone Wrapper. What it does is it takes the adapter to the next level. With the adapter, we're still using Backbone views. Uh, we wanted to get rid of that completely. So the React Backbone Wrapper makes an app root level React component that completely releases Chaplin and all of the features that come with it and lets React take care of the whole show. I think this is what everyone loves about it because it was so simple to insert. And the ideas are more or less the same, but we extend the adapter. What we do is we check for a mounted component, we check for updates, we pass in props, which are uh, properties, which I'll talk about in just a second. We find the, the node in the DOM, apply that identifier class, this time we change it to a reactive wrapper, and then just render, and then we're good to go. 
no delays, no performance lags, it just works. We're still in the process of tweaking this, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but it's worked great thus far. And here we are, our sign-up header uh, component. Uh, since we are using CoffeeScript, uh, you have to use something like CJSX. It works great, but there are bugs with it, so if you're looking to try something new, uh, like I said, go with Babel. It's been awesome. And here we go. Uh, like I said, don't freak out about the template in view. It's okay. We're not doing much JavaScript manipulation here, but we've got our render method, and then we wrap a header around just the trunk club. Imagine that being a logo, for example. Super simple, super basic. But, you know, we want to do some more creative stuff, right? We want to pass down data. We want to see some interaction. We want to see, you know, cool things happen. So, we pass down data, multiple models and collections, as props. Uh, props, props are basically objects that React lets you play around with. And the mixing that we're uh, using kind of requires them. So here we are, we're namespacing uh, model for member and stylist, and then we're grabbing some more information from that model with, and then passing it through as a collection. We've got addresses and credit cards, for example. So what are props? I know this isn't a React talk, but it's great to go over these things, right? React props are properties that are received from above and are immutable as far as the component is concerned. It's short for properties. It's, comp it's component configuration. A component can't change its own props, but it's responsible for the props of its children. Um, and while we're at it, let's just go over state too, because they play a great role together. State starts with a default value when a component mounts and then suffers from mutations in time, mostly generated from user events. Submitting a form, clicking a button, changing the page, anything a user interacts with should always be state. Uh, there's a great way to kind of keep track of that. Components manage its own state internally. You can think of them, you can think of state as private. It doesn't affect the state of its children. A component can't change its own props, but it could change its own state. A component can't change a child's prop. A component can change a child's prop before passing them down, but it can't change its own. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, in any case, here we are. Let's pass down some data. So as you saw earlier, we were passing in addresses and credit cards. Here we are. We want to map over the addresses. We have a separate address component living somewhere, and we're passing in a key prop and an address prop. This is what I was talking about when you can pass down props to other sets of components. This is where you would make the mutation, do whatever you have to do before the component below it gets it. So like I said, we're consuming the address collection, mapping them over uh, in, the, in our account profile. Uh, I'll mention this too, pro tip, pass in a key. Whenever you do a map, um, it's React's way of doing uh, reconciliation, making sure there's nothing weird that happens. It'll ensure that any child within that key will be ordered, reordered instead of clobbered, or destroyed instead of reused. So it's important to have. Um, even if you forget that after this presentation, React does a really good job with error messages. It'll console everything out and let you know exactly what you should stack overflow or Google for. So don't worry about it too much. Now, we've passed down props. We talked about state. But the most important part of this is how does React know that our model has been updated, or we changed something, or our collection's been updated. This is where the Backbone React component mix and comes from. It'll glue your Backbone model and collections into React components. This was made by Jose Magalhaes, and it's been a fantastic part of our workflow. So once your component is mounted, a wrapper starts listening to models and collection changes to automatically set component stave and achieve UI binding through reactive updates. Uh, here's a very simple example. Get model, member is syncing. If it's syncing, let's show a loading indicator. Otherwise, let's load that member information. It's super simple, and it's that easy. There's no weird things happening. Uh, it just works. So um, this mix and gives us some awesome helper methods. Because as you recall, props are immutable. You can't change them. But sometimes you want to update that model. You want to update a first and last name. You want to update an email address. You have to change that stuff. So what we get is two really great helper functions. 
this.get model and this.collection, or this.get collection. Uh, when you're using just one model, you can just do this.get model.get name. And when you're using numerous, you kind of just use that namespace we talked about previously. Uh, get model.member.get name. And then uh, setting works the same way. A get model.address.set zip code, and then whatever your zip code may be. Get collection, same idea. Uh, you saw that earlier when we were looping over an array of uh, models. So there are some gotchas that we faced, especially if you are using CoffeeScript. Uh, like I said earlier, CJSX is great if you need to get something up and running and you need to get moving. You don't have time to start rewriting an app, but you want to use CoffeeScript. Babel is much more robust. If you can use it, use it. Uh, implicit returns in CoffeeScript, uh, sometimes those will bite you in the butt, right? Remember to wrap a series of components in a parent div. Otherwise, it won't render like you want it to. Uh, since what React does is it renders or um, it re-renders the, it returns the main component. And if there's other things involved, it just won't work out. So you want to wrap everything in a parent div. And then event handlers, too. We were getting this pesky, pesky console.log, and we couldn't figure it out. You know, like. We're not using prevent. When clicking a button, you get this weird, oh, stop using event uh, return false. Like use event prop or event stop propagation. A really weird message. But that's because it's not because of what we were doing. It's because of what CJSX was doing and what CoffeeScript was doing behind the scenes. It'll emit a warning. Um, so just look out for that. So final thoughts. This is all very temporary. We don't plan to keep building our apps this way. All of our newer single page applications are more robust Flux and React applications that use ES6 and all those fun things that we've been learning about. Uh, so please, um, once, you get the, once you get the ability to, start building a new app with it. It's great for now and it works fantastically, but it can get sort of mingled sometimes. So just keep that in mind once your apps do grow to just outrageous sizes. And then, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Joe Hudson. I'm not sure if you're here anywhere, Joe, but uh, he built this React Backbone Mixin 2. I haven't had a chance to use it uh, this week, but it seems to be pretty awesome. He seems to be a really smart guy, so give that a shot as well. All right, everyone. Thank you. That was Backbone React Applications. <laughs>